Wow, it's very exciting. What's going to happen? Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's lecture. It's been a while. Um, ben has informed me it's been five years, three months, six days, 17 hours and 12 minutes, but who's counting? <laughs> who's counting? Oh boy. The, I loved doing my grandmaster and residencies and uh, the various lectures. My favorites were children's lectures. Oh, I just love teasing the kids. Um, but it's been a long time. I've been doing a lot of broadcasts, obviously, for the club. And it's really nice uh, to see the Grandmaster in Residence program going so well with so many great players coming and sharing uh, their games and their thoughts. And somehow, I don't know exactly how I did it, but I finagled my way in and I got a chance to do a lecture. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's really, really nice. And thank you uh, for those of you in the chat who are sending me all kinds of smiling faces. <laughs> I hope they're smiling faces. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, they're, okay, so great. I, I get to do a lecture. And what could I lecture on? So I'm sitting there thinking, what should I lecture about? And I am not joking. Almost at the moment I got the gig to do this lecture, it was incredible. There was a tournament going on in Norway. It was the first round of the Norway Stavanger chess tournament. And it was Fabiano versus Magnus. And Fabiano and Magnus, well, as you know, going back to their world championship match in 2018, they've been throwing the patties at each other for many, many years. And in many of their clashes, it's been number one versus number two. And I don't care what your sport is. I mean, whether it's sprint racing, boxing, chess, snooker, when number one plays number two, you got to stop and watch the match. And Fabi won the game, his first victory in classical chess over Magnus in eight years. <laughs> it was like, whoa, this is perfect. I know what I'm going to lecture on. I got this. I mean, I'm here in St. Louis. It's uh, Fabi's hometown. How could I not do a special lecture on their, on their game? And uh, Fabi opened up E4. And as you know, in their world championship match uh, games, it was really the Sveshnikov variation that Fabi had trouble breaking. And in fact, in their world championship match game, in the world match, world championship match, I want to say uh, none of the classical games, not a single one, ended in a victory. All of the classical games were drawn, and uh, Fabi had a very hard time getting any advantage against um, Magnus in the conventional, and so he he, he threw in a Rosalimo here or there. Uh, bishop b5 uh, to mix it up. But again, uh, Fabi could not break Magnus's defenses. And it's not that he couldn't break Magnus's defenses. It's just that he didn't even get advantages. And that's really, really annoying. You know, you're white. You want to be, you know, something going on. So uh, I was very, very curious to see what Fabi had prepared. Uh, against Sveshnikov and uh, Jan uh, Nepo. In his world championship match in Dubai, he had a hard time getting anything in a very conventional uh, Rui Lopez. Uh, Magnus uh, defended incredibly well against Nepo as black. And so when, when Fabi opened up E4, I was expecting the classical e5, as well as the Sveshnikov by Magnus. And for me, I mean, we know Magnus can play anything. And I remember a game he had with, I think it was Mickey Adams from a, an Olympiad. 
he even played <laughs> this. I don't know if you remember the game, but it was like, <laughs> let's say Magnus got his just desserts in that game and uh, he lost with the black pieces. Uh, Mickey won. But really, the problem when you're playing against Magnus, when you're facing Magnus, is he can play anything. He can play anything. And even though he did choose to play the French defense, and he has played the French defense, it was a little bit surprising for me. I thought that uh, we were for sure going to see a, a, a clash of the Sveshnikov or even a conventional classical. By the way, I also want to say that uh, this lecture is really so informal and uh, it's meant to draw you in and to ask questions. So if you ever at any moment have a question and say this, that, or the other thing, just raise your hand and I'll call upon you and I'll, and I'll ask you. Now, the crazy thing is virtually anywhere you go in professional chess today, anywhere you go, whatever your opening is, whether it be a Perk defense, a Sveshnikov, a, uh, a Scotch, my gosh, a Russian defense, wherever you go, the opening theory is advancing almost with avalanche-like speeds. I mean, today, more and more and more games are being captured. Uh, by captured, I mean in databases. So I'm even seeing in databases uh, Title Tuesday Blitz games. <laughs> and believe me, those Title Tuesday uh, uh, tournaments are really, really strong. So maybe we should be paying attention to the Blitz games. But if you start including those Blitz games, then the millions of databases uh, games just keep growing exponentially. And you'll see that the opening theory is, is really, really advancing. So almost one of the questions that I'll ask you, ah, you think it's just a one-way ticket, ah, not so fast, is when did theory stop? Whoa, in other words, the two players played down an accepted pathway that opening theory, modern theory describes that you should do this and this and this and this. So where did they deviate? Where did they stop uh, modern theory? So knight c3, okay, against the French defense, I must say I was always very happy as black when they played the close. Today, uh, the advance, pardon me, the advance French, when they played the move e5, I was always happy as black when they did that. And in fact, uh, on numerous occasions, I often played like this as black. Don't laugh. <laughs> but I, I had very, very specific ideas uh, about the French defense, and I always liked it when they played the advance. And today, the advance variation is considered maybe the most dangerous or formidable. Uh, knight d2. Um, the Tarash or knight c3, the winner were. Now, for Fabi, while he plays also like Magnus, just practically everything, I think he has a favorite towards the winner were knight c3. Here I like to tell a, a, a short story that against the Tarash, uh, there was the 1974 World finals candidates match. So in 1974, there was the match Victor Korchnoi versus Anatoly Karpov. The winner of that match, and it was a 24 game match that finished three to two in favor of Anatoly Karpov, the winner of the match would play against Bobby Fischer in the 1975 World Championship match, a match that did not take place <laughs> because Bobby didn't play. In that match, Anatoly Karpov played knight d2, and Victor was rather reluctant to go into the Steinitz, and he was looking for an alternative. And his second, Yasha Murray, said, 
you should play bishop e7. A nice little waiting move. It's a waiting move and it says to white, go ahead and make a move. And in those days, it was a rather dangerous to help Viktor Korchnoi because Anatoly Karpov was the favored son and Viktor Korchnoi was a little bit unfavored. So Roman Jinji Hajvili uh, helped Viktor Korchnoi during the match, but did so by telephone. So Roman called Viktor and said, Viktor, I've got a great, great idea. On the third move, you should move your bishop. And yes, said Victor, uh, Yasha Murray told me I should play bishop e7. No, said Roman Jinjashvili, you should play bishop d7. <laughs> so the idea of, a, and I actually uh, played bishop e7 very, very successfully. Now the idea of the move bishop e7 is to give white the move, okay? So if you were white, and you were facing this position for the first time, what move would you play? And uh, anybody who's got ideas, let me know. Would you play knight f3? How many in the audience would play knight f3? Okay, very good. How many in the audience would play queen g4? Not so many takers. How many in the audience would play the move c3? c3 kind of keeping the pawn protected. How many like c3? Okay. So you see the move bishop e7 has caused you to stop and think. <clears throat> what, you, what should you do? How many like the move e5? e5, e5, okay, e5, I see. Yeah, there's some, 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 some takers with the move e5. So it's sort of like you've played an advanced French. You've played the move e5. Black's played strange little move bishop e7. And you've convinced yourself that the best answer to bishop e7 is knight d2. Well, it's very interesting how you get those moments like this where knight d2, bishop e7, you present your opponent with the move, okay? So for those of you who like the move C3, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with C3, one of the things you always like to do is shop and compare, right? So if against knight D2, you wanted to play the Akiba Rubinstein variation, takes, takes, knight takes, knight D7, one of the things you would not do is in this position. So you're not interested in c3. You're really not interested in c3 at all. What you're really interested in doing is setting up a situation where you're castling long. Now when you castle long, the move c2, c3 is not only not required, it's actually loosening the position up. So when you start in this moment, after bishop e7 with the move c3, you're actually inviting black to transpose into a Rubinstein variation where the move c3 is wrong. For those of you who like the move knight f3, one of the reasons you play knight d2 is that after knight f6, e5, knight d7, you get to play f4 and you play for the big center. You get the clamp. You clamp down on the center with f4, and oops, now you put your knight in the way of f3. You're almost obliged to play variations like this one, where it's not everybody's cup of tea, but you often end up sacrificing the pawn on d4. Now again, that's very, very standard stuff and you've got lots and lots of, lots of games where that pawn sacrifice is common. So when you are facing knight d2, there's a lot of flexibility on black side. When you play knight c3, your, your flexible moments go way down 
it's sort of like this knight on c3, it puts some pressure. For first of all, there's no bishop d7 anymore. That would just hang the d5 pawn. And against knight c3, really theory has said the pathway is very narrow. You either play bishop b4, the winner were variation, e5. How many of you recently saw the game between Viswanathan Nan and Magnus Carlsen that was played in Dubai? Ooh, that was a magnificent game. And maybe uh, this game convinced Magnus that he should play the winner <laughs> and not the Steinitz line. So for the better part of 150 years, knight f6 has been a very conventional move for the French. And after e5, knight d7, f2, f4 has been thousands and thousands of uh, games uh, with f4. Quick question for my audience. If you had white and the opponent played knight e4, knight e4 here, and you're surprised by this move, right? Because like, wow, everybody's been playing knight d7 for so long and now suddenly your opponent plays knight e4. What's, what move would you guys play? Would you take the knight? How many of you would take the knight? Okay. How many of you would move the knight away, like knight e2, in order to try to, try to win the knight, uh, trap the knight with f3 and h4? Interesting. For those of you who would take the knight, knight takes, pawn takes, how would you follow up? What, what move? Would you play the move bishop e3? Just that looks like a pretty normal conventional move, right? Would you play bishop e3 or would you play another move here? Queen e2. Which one? Queen e2. Queen e2. Well, one thing that the, the knight has done, that trade, oh, yeah. it, no worries, uh, is that uh, you, wh why you, you would love to play a move, for example, like queen g4 here and pick up the pawn queen takes. There are a lot of variations where you have these tricky ideas. They simply do not work here because of bishop b4 check. But it was really funny because now today they have computers and the computers will immediately tell you knight e4 is a bad move. But at the time before the computers, I played knight e4 in a couple of games and I did really good. Especially when my opponents would play moves like c3 and or bishop e3. I would play a very quick c5 and I'd get a very easy game. Somebody, and I believe his name was Brian McLaren, played the move bishop c4 against me. And that put the kibosh <laughs> on this line. The problem is this pawn on e4 is actually weak, not in the immediate term, but in the long term. And the move bishop c4 is designed to stop me from playing c5 because of d5. And I was in trouble as black. I end up playing a move like b6, but after knight e2, bishop b7, castles, I simply did not like my game at all as black. White was very quick to play knight to g3, rook to e1, and I ended up crying. <laughs> I was losing a pawn. Okay, back to the game. F4, C5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop E3. I'm looking in my database and I'm seeing tens of thousands of games and we're not even close to the tabia position. Queen, uh, Queen B6 has been by far the most conventional move for uh, decades, I want to say. And Queen D2 and a lot, a lot of modern games will feature this uh, capture on uh, b2, uh, and the variations are very, very long. a7, a6 is the second most popular move, and certainly uh, Fabi uh, 
is incredibly, incredibly well prepared, just about anything. And I'm sure uh, for Fabi, he did most of his work uh, on queen b6, because he could expect that most of his opponents would play the move queen b6. After the move a7, a6, one of the whole concepts of the French defense is that as black, you're a counterattacker, okay? You're basically saying, as black, you're making the following argument. Come forward, step forward, put your pawn on e5, grab the lion's share of the center, and I'm going to counterattack you in the center with the move c5, as well as the move f6. So I'm going to attack your center from the sides with those two moves. <clears throat> Now, White's whole strategy is, hey, I've got this big, imposing center, and I'm just going to sit on you. I'm just going to hold on, take all the squares in the center of the board, and you're going to suffocate. Your pieces will have no good squares, and uh, from uh, the middle game to the end game, you're just going to suffer a space disadvantage. So the two sides make their intentions very, very clear. One of the things that you'll notice about White's position, I'll ask the audience, what is White's worst piece? What is White's worst piece? Do you guys think the bishop on f1 is bad? Yes, no, 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 yes, no, no. You think the bishop on e3 is bad? Yes, no, 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 yes. How about the knight on f3? Everybody likes that, right? What do you guys think of the knight on c3? Boo. Boo, exactly, bravo. exactly. No bravo for the knight on c3. The knight on c3 is actually in the way. Uh, the move a7, a6, by the way, has really taken away one of the very few squares that the, the knight can jump to freely, and a knight b5 and knight e4. And in an ideal world, White would just like to play the move c2, c3, reinforce his center, and that is why knight e2 is one of the most conventional moves for White, along with very, very standard stuff, queen d2. Now, I pay, played this position as black in my practice, and against queen d2, I took and played bishop c5, I believe, against Nick de Fermian in one of the US championship games that uh, we competed at. Uh, that game was a draw. And this move, knight e2, I think uh, is more suitable to the position from White's point of view. From White's point of view, he knows that the counter attack is coming on the d4 square and on the e5 pawn after f6. So knight e2, is sort of like preparation. I'm going to play the move c2, c3, completely making my center um, impregnable. And then you've got a problem as black. What are you going to do with your pieces? Think of that about the, the, the suffering bishop on c8, as well as the suffering knight on d7. What are you going to do? So knight e2 really throws down the gauntlet to black and say, well, you, you better do something because as soon as I play c3, you're in trouble. Queen b6, queen c1. In this case, the threat of capturing the pawn on b2 was very real. All of this, again, bishop e7, c3, all of this is absolutely conventional opening chess theory. So like when you turn on your engines and you play through the game, every one of the moves thus far, with the exception of maybe a6, will be the top choice of the engine. After castles, well, white has a bit of a problem. White's problem is that, well, his knight is better placed on e2 than on c3, but this bishop on f1 is kind of suffering. He's kind of like, Coach, you got to get me in the game. Like, what are you doing? You got to do something. Help me, coach. So, g2, g3. Uh, 
Also, very, very conventional. The idea here is, again, the bishop's diagonal is blocked. The bishop is, is looking to play to, to g2, defending the knight, prepping castles, as well as bishop h3. Again, all standard theory, f7, f6. Bishop g2. At this moment, I'll pause and I'll say, how many of you like the move bishop h3? Bishop h3. Eh, just a little, just a few hands. Me, I loved it. I, I was like, why don't you play bishop h3? Why don't you play bishop h3? That looks like a, a really decent move uh, to my eyes. You're threatening to pick off a peshki with a check. And uh, life's good, right? And it's really funny. Uh, bishop h3, by the way, is conventional. It has been played in numerous games. And in many of the games, black plays the move f5. Which is kind of funny. Like, you, you, you just played f6 to open up the game, and then you played f5 to close the game down. And it's sort of like, well, why did you do that? Well, it turns out the bishop is not that great on h3, and g2 is actually a better diagonal for reasons that are oftentimes associated with c3, c4. The other problem with the bishop on h3 is that black knight on d7 is, well, I think the scientific wor word is crap. It's like, what, what, what is the knight doing on d7? The queen on b6 is in the way, and it's really conventional in these positions that black plays the move queen, b5, uh, tagging the knight, if you will, in order to play the move knight b6. And again, the bishop is actually misplaced on h3. Okay, uh, I like the move bishop h3. That would have been maybe my choice, and uh, the most conventional move is bishop g2. c takes d4. Interestingly enough, in this position, queen b5 is also a major alternative uh, and has been played as well. c takes d4, c takes d4, queen a5 check. <clears throat> Another funny move, queen b5 uh, invites the knight to come back to the square c3, and the queen drops in on the d3 square. So uh, this whole queen d5, queen d3 maneuver, I thought was kind of funny. Queen a5 check is uh, Magnus's move. Then the crazy part is, uh, well, it's coming up. So far, we all agree that this is theory, right? And knight c3 is a, a normal move. How many of you like the move bishop d2? Bishop b2 blocking, blocking the check with a tempo. I mean, yeah, it's pretty good, right? Well, that's that's the main move. <laughs> Bishop d2, and then the game goes queen to d5, queen, pardon me, queen to b5, and again, black is looking to play knight b6, bishop d7, rook c8. He's looking to drop his queen in on d3, but According to my very weak database, uh, knight c3, a move the computer likes a lot, is new. Whoa. I mean, that looks like a pretty obvious move to me. <laughs> and, uh, well, it, it, it gets the novelty according to my databases, which, again, aren't that great. Okay, knight c3. Knight b6, and now we come to a major moment, a major moment for Fabi. Okay, why, why didn't Magnus capture on e5? Why don't you capture on e5? Why didn't he capture? Yeah, 
So f takes e5, f takes e5, yeah? So f takes e5, f takes e5. This looks like a pretty straightforward thing. And then knight b6. So from black's point of view, black has opened up the f file. He's prepared to play bishop d7. He's prepared to play knight c4. You played the move f6. Why didn't he follow through with uh, capturing? Well, it's sort of like the players wanted to not give their opponent an option. So in this position, <clears throat> Magnus could capture on e5 or play the move he played in the game, which was knight b6. But if he captures immediately on e5, he gives Fabi an option that he doesn't have in the game. The option that he gives Fabi is the move bishop g5. What do I mean? Fe, Fe, knight b6, castle. Now exactly here, if you don't immediately play the move knight c4, much like the game, you've got to be a little bit scared that white might play b3 and stop the knight from coming to c4. But let's say the knight does come to c4. Knight c4. Now, it would be nice from black's point of view if there was a pawn on f4 so that this bishop would have to retreat to f2. If there was a pawn on f4, I, I would prevent me from playing the move bishop g5. So imagine we continue, bishop takes g5, knight takes g5. Okay, well, wait a minute. The opening of the f file, who benefited from that? Well, if you look at the position, you can actually see it's pretty clear that white is the one who's benefiting. If you play knight takes d4, rook takes f8 check, king takes f8, besides the fact I can all already grab knight takes h7 check, I also have queen f4 check. And there are some very, very complicated uh, variations that now continue knight f5, g4, queen b6 check. It's really annoying when you get a position like this and your engine goes triple zeros. <laughs> You're like, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> How can you say triple zeros? I mean, without, ah! It's really, really, really bad. But also knight takes h7 check is another one of those variations that ends up also for some reason being a triple zero. Here the computer likes playing queen g4 check before picking up the knight and giving white just a tad of an advantage. So it's sort of like I was really vexed in this moment why Magnus didn't take on e5 and play knight b6. And I really wanted to find out, and I went down a rabbit hole with my chess engine, and there went my afternoon. <laughs> and I still don't understand. <laughs> I can't forcefully say that the move f take, f6 takes e5 uh, was better or worse. Magnus played knight b6, and now here it's sort of like, again, the players are like, bluffing a little bit with each other because uh, Fabi did not want to castle knight c4 and be denied the opportunity for bishop g5. Here he thinks, well, after bishop, um, bishop to f2, takes on e5, takes on e5, bishop d7, Fabi's not happy. He's looking around and he's saying, this bishop is a little passive, this bishop's a little passive. What exactly is going on here? What am I doing? So in this position, recognizing that he doesn't want to have these passive bishops, Fabi captured on f6 first, a move I really like. I like this move a lot because essentially if you capture with the pawn, well, your king is going to be a little bit loose. Always, 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 it's like 
white has this move f5 that hangs over the position. White is ready to play castles, and any time you take on f5, a move like knight h4 is going to give white a very, very promising attack. So, takes, you're forced to take with the bishop, and the move b2, b3. It was very important that in this position, you don't play the move b3. Why don't you play the move b3? Why? What's wrong with b3? What's wrong with b3? Yes, yes, precisely. That's exactly right. After you move bishop b4, yikes, uh, my knight is really in this very awkward pin, and I'm virtually forced to play bishop to d2. In these types of positions, French defense players love these sacrifices. Just as Sicilian players, if you're black and a Sicilian, an open Sicilian, you love to play rook takes c3. When you're on the black side of a French defense, you love to make the exchange sacrifice rook takes f3. And this is a very conventional opportunity here. You don't even think about it. You just do it. <laughs> you sacrifice the exchange on f3. You grab a pawn and... You just hope it works. <laughs> usually it does, let me assure you, usually it does. Uh, but this is exactly what Fabi wanted to avoid. So he captured on f6 first, he distracted the bishop away, and only now played the move b2, b3, stopping the knight from coming to c4. Okay, but as we say, you know, each move has its pros and cons. I love the move b3, and I think a lot of players would happily keep that knight at bay, and probably for the same reasons, they would like to play a3 and keep the other knight stuck on the c6 square. But each move has its pros and cons, and in this case, the pawn on b2 was defending the knight. The pawn on b3 is not defending the knight. So bishop d7, castles, rook c8 comes right away, and bingo bongo, we've got to be careful that something, we don't have an accident on the open uh, CFA. Queen d2, so for the moment, knight takes d4 doesn't work. Why doesn't knight takes d4, why does knight takes d4 not work? What's wrong with knight takes d4, everybody? Bishop takes d4, bishop takes d4. Knight takes, queen takes. Ha ha! I won my pawn. <laughs> Julian. Queen takes d4 and the first c3 d4 and of queen c3 queen d3. And the knight is hanging. Yes, exactly. So, no. Uh, tactics at the moment. The problem is the knight on b6 is hanging. So, bishop to e7. Well, we've seen this issue before. As soon as the bishop drops in on b4, we've got an issue. We've got a real, real problem. I would have thought that as white, how many of you would play the move a3? a2, a3 here. So the idea is just to stop bishop b4, right? But then what if, what if we had this really, really annoying opponent <laughs> and he took the pawn on a3 and he said, well, pr pr prove, prove me wrong, prove the pawn sacrifice. Well, it turns out, I mean, even though you're putting yourself in what, what looks like a, a terrible pin, there's no way to exploit it. My, my computer uh, engine, it, it says bishop takes a3 is really fine for black. And it's just like, oops. So I'm sure at the board, uh, such thoughts went through Fabi's mind and he said, 
I'm, Magnus is going to take the pawn. <laughs> if I put it out there, he's going to grab it. He played knight e2. Knight e2. And it's rather reluctant that white is, uh, is trading queens because white really, he's, he's thinking to himself, how am I going to stir up trouble on the king side? And keeping queens is usually something that white wants in these French middle game positions. Queen takes d2, bishop takes d2, rook to c7. And it's kind of strange. If something goes wrong, like rook c7 looks like a very decent move to my eyes, but if something is going wrong, it starts to go wrong for Magnus at this moment. Right here, things start to go wrong. So, we're going to criticize Magnus's move, rook c7, and say, You're, you may be the number one player in the world, ha, 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 but I'm going to educate you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we want to say. So how do we go about doing that, educating the number one player in the world? Well, the position it's not full of sharp tactics. It's not like we've got to analyze checks and captures. Not that I could see. Rather, what I like to do is I like to go around the board and look at all the pieces and I talk to my pieces and I say, how you doing? Are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy? So if I'm in black shoes, I go, who's happy? And black's rooks tell me, I'm great. I'm doing fine, coach. My rook on c8 says I'm on the open file. That, I'm, I'm happy. This rook says, well, I'm on the half open file. I'm happy. So the rooks are happy. The knight on c6 is pretty happy. This bishop, which has a pretty good view of all the proceedings, it's kind of happy. Maybe the bishop on d7 is a little bit unhappy, kind of. It's it's kind of like wedged in there, you know, like a wedgie. It's a little unhappy. And, you know, you might start thinking to yourself as black, you know what I'd really like to do is I kind of like to sit on these squares a3 and b4. So something like bishop a3, knight b4, rook c2. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can feel it. I, I, I'm getting my mojo going here. I can see that bishop a3 uh, is a very attractive looking move. But there's one guy in the position that's crying. What piece of blacks is unhappy? What piece of black is the most unhappy? Right yeah. The knight on B, coach, what are you doing to me? You know, look at this. This knight on B6 is not capturing its own person. Can't go to C4, can't go to A4. So the knight on B6, and this is really what I do, is I literally, I go down and I talk to my guys and I say, who, you know, who is not performing well? And the knight on B6 says, that's me. Knight on b6 says, I'm not performing well. So there's two things that you could do to improve the knight's performance. One is to get rid, uh, to, to open uh, the d7 square, vacate the d7 square, play a move like bishop e8, idea of bishop g6 and knight d7, or play the move knight a8. Not everybody's cup of tea, but if you've got the time to continue your development with knight c7, knight b5, pressuring the pawn, knight d6, closed positions allow you these maneuvering opportunities. Open positions, you don't have time to move a knight three, four, five times to get the knight to an ideal square. You might just be blown off the board by the, the, the very nature of open position. Here, I would have said that uh, conventional moves like bishop e8 
and or Knight A8 better suit the needs of the position. After the move Rook C7, Rook to C1, Magnus followed up with the very natural looking Rook C8. Again, from Magnus's point of view, he's ready to play Bishop A3 on a good day Knight B5, and he'll say to the Knight on B6, ah, stay quiet, the rest of us are fighting. You, 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 you'll do fine. I'll, I'll let you into the game uh, later. But it's exactly at this moment that Fabi has a very, very nice tactic. A very nice tactic. What did Fabi play? Throw it out there if you know the answer. Here it comes. Are you ready? Here it comes. Okay, so we've talked about Magnus's position and what Magnus should have done and why the knight on b6 was kind of like not ideal. From White's point of view, there's a lot of things about his position that need improvement. First of all, the knight on e2 has no great shakes, right? Like, you would love to put the knight on d4, so you start to think to yourself, I should play a move like knight e5, force a trade of knights, and maybe recapture with the d4 pawn, so I could put my knight on d4. My knight on e2 needs a better life. My bishop on g2, you know, okay, it's protecting my king, but it's kind of boring. Like, the, knight, the bishop on g2 is playing a rather limited role. Fabi finds a very, very nice move, f4, f5, that does an enormous amount of good for white's position. The first thing it does is it opens up the bishop, and look at here, that rook on c7, it's actually trapped. It doesn't have a square, so bishop f4 could snag an exchange. Second of all, when you play the move f5, you want to capture on e6 so that your knight, you could capture on e6 so the knight can go to f4 and really attacking the bishop on e6, attacking the pawn on d5, and the bishop on g2 is really, really uh, happy. By the way, I mean, uh, our street performers, uh, we've got some St. Louis blues going on here. So <laughs> That comes with the lecture, it comes with a lecture, <laughs> but if you want to tip the guy, <laughs> you're very, very welcome. There's a whole band out there. And they're just right on the corner of the club <laughs> as well. So I really like the move F5, and I think it's here where the tables really started turning for Magnus, because um, it's no longer easy for him to play. Yes, he could play a quiet little move like bishop to d6, but after takes, 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 it's actually white who's getting a very nice initiative uh, going. Um, the rooks on the c-file are actually, well, they're not that great anymore. All right, uh, Magnus drops in, bishop a3, rook to e1, and bishop to, to b4. So here we'll kind of uh, leave it over to you guys. Uh, and again, imagine yourself in Fabi's shoes. This is now your game, okay? And you see that your pieces the rook on e1, the rook on f1, the bishop on g2, the knight on e2 ready to spring to f4 square. All your pieces are ready to come to life. But you have to play the precise series of moves to prove your advantage. So, you're white. Call out your moves. Go ahead. If you were white, what would you do? Okay, I'll do it another way. How many of you would like to take on e6? 
I like that. How many of you would like to take on B4? How many of you would like to do both? <laughs> like at once? Well, oftentimes when you have these moments where you have a choice between two desirable captures, make the capture that limits your opponent's options. So if you want to play bishop takes b4 and you want to take on e6, take the bishop on b4 first. Because if you take the pawn on e6, yeah, he could take back and yeah, you, you kind of expect that he would. But you also give your opponent a different ch a chance to make a different move. He could take on, on d2 and in this case, after you take on e3, he's got a check and now you have to calculate something a little bit differently. So when you have the choice of making a capture, make the capture that forces your opponent's hand. In this case, bishop takes b4, knight takes b4. He has to take. Takes, takes, and now back over to yourselves. Okay. Actually, this one is kind of too easy, right? How many of you want to play knight f4? Those of you who don't want to play knight f4 have to leave the room. <laughs> because knight f4 is a move we live for. I mean, this is, this is like the petals of a flower, you know, opening up. The knight on e2 is a passive square. On the f4 square, holy smokes, look at this. The knight reaches into black's position, tacks the bishop on e6. The rook is on this magnificent open file. Knight f4 is super duper. Okay, bishop f5, your turn. Let's see, what are our candidate moves? How many of you would like to play rook to e5? Rook to e5, nice. How many of you would like to play knight to e5? Knight to e5, nice. Okay, how many of you would like to play knight to h4? Oh, Julian, you like knight h4? Or yeah. did, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, here my thinking and the way I approach chess is there's no question what I'm doing. I'm playing the move knight e5, okay? I'm playing the move knight e5. And I'm doing it for very, very, very specific uh, reasons. First of all, knights love to be centralized. I mean, you play chess long enough, you really, really respect a centralized knight. Secondly, knights actually get better when they're defended. Like what? It's a very, very strange property. It's sort of like knights love to be in literally a nest where they are protected. The knight on e5 is protected by the pawn on d4, but once you put the knight on e5, beautiful things start to happen. First of all, did you hear the cheering of the bishop <laughs> on g2, right? That's really, really nice. Uh, secondly, did you notice that you might be threatening a3 and knight takes d5? And then finally, and this is not an inconsiderable point, when you put the knight on e5, see this bishop on f5 doesn't have a lot of squares to go to. The knight on e5 does what for white's position? What's another benefit of this knight on e5? Yes, it does. It does. It limits the squares for the bishop, defends the d3 square, but also defends the g4 square which means that the bishop can't go to g4. Not that the bishop actually wanted to go to g4, but it does allow 
g3, g4. After the move knight e5, and let's see, what would have happened, for example, on knight h4? So after knight h4, let's say I would play bishop e4. And more or less, Julian, you want to take it, yeah? Yes. Yeah, take, take. Okay, so take, take. Knight e6, and let's drop down. Knight f5, and for what it's worth, this knight on, D, on b6 that had been out of the game at least is not crying anymore, <laughs> you know. Uh, we could take a pawn. We could take a pawn. Um, and I'm just not sure. It might be one of the, it might be a situation where white is actually doing really well. But it also might be a situation where after rook takes a2, we're allowing a lot of counterplay that maybe, maybe we didn't want to allow. Knight h4 is a move that you want to play when you calculate something that's very, very forcing that really works out very well in your favor. I'm not 100% sure that the move knight h4 this is one of those variations that, that uh, it, it appears to me to be very forcing, yeah? But it could also be one of those things that maybe mm, if, the, if the engines go triple zeros on me, <laughs> I get upset. I really love the move knight e5. I just like, I mean, for, for, for me, that just is like this enormous... Uh, link of a chain. Knight e5, g7, g6. Okay. Now, here we go. Here we go. We're playing against the number one player in the world, Magnus Carlsen. He's just played the move g7, g6, which defends the bishop because there was, you know, ideas of a discovered attack with knight takes d5 and rook takes f5 and issues, issues galore. What, what did Fabi play? What did Fabi play? How many of you like the move a2, a3? a2, a3. How many of you like the move g3, g4? g3, g4. Very nice move. And here again, it's one of those things that uh, you're given a choice of very attractive moves. So the first thing is you really, really want to play knight takes d5. Like that would just be, you know, dream, right? But the knight on b4, the knight on b6 both defend the pawn. So the urge to play a2, a3 get rid of the knight, kick that knight out of the way, is a very, very strong one. But then you analyze. You go a2, a3, knight c2, knight takes d5. You go, well, knight takes e1. Uh, you start to panic, right? Rook takes e1 allows rook c1. Knight takes b6. Uh, knight takes g2. Knight takes, knight e3, and you start to wonder if you've done it right. <laughs> like, uh, uh, not so sure. So a2, a3 might lead you astray, might lead you astray. The other thing about a2, a3, oops, excuse me, a2, a3, is after knight c2, knight takes d5. Imagine knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, king g7. Yay! This is great, right? This is really great. We've done exactly what we wanted. When we played the move a3, we wanted to win that pawn on d5. And now it's sort of like, well, maybe we're not so excited anymore about our position because the knight on c2 is actually really 
annoying. <laughs> Who allowed the knight on c2 to be so annoying? It's hitting the pawn on d4, it's hitting the knight, pardon me, it, the knight is hitting the rook on e1. And worse of all, black might be able to play rook d8 in the very near future and definitely win his pawn back. In short, the move a2, a3 leads us on the wrong track. But we come back to the position and we see the move g4 and we go, ah, where is the bishop going? If we could entice the bishop to the c2 square, wow, now the move a2, a3 is really attractive because the bishop is occupying the c2 square. The knight on b4 will have to go. Knight takes d5 and white's position plays itself. So the move g4 actually is the best, the most forcing, and Fabi played it. Magnus played bishop e4. Here I'm not going to ask you guys because this is a Yasser Sarawan lecture and Yasser Sarawan will tell you Take the pawn. <laughs> Bishop takes, pawn takes, a2, a3, and he took the pawn. Uh, exactly here, funnily enough, my engine says that uh, Magnus played the mistake, rook, well, mistake is strong, uh, an inaccurate move is what the computer says. The engine actually suggests knight takes f4 and knight d5 and considers that white has a significant advantage after rook f7 but not a winning advantage. Perversely, from the way I think about chess, I'm absolutely convinced that when Magnus went through this whole complex uh, complications after the move f5, he had reached this position in his mind. And he played the move that I really want to play as black, which is rook to c3. This looks like a really great move because after all, you possess the open c file. Why not play the move rook c3 and capture these pawns and you know the other rook could come down. Uh, any knight trades, really seem to be okay for, for um, black. In other words, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, not a problem. Rook takes b3 is on black's agenda. But now it gets hard, now it gets tough. Here is where Fabi found a really, really nice move and this is where I put you on your toes. What move did Fabi play as white. Mm. Knight e6. Knight e6. Okay, that looks like a very nice move. Uh, it definitely covers a lot of squares. It doesn't exactly, well, you can't play rook f8, so that's a good thing. I must, I'm going to ask what is the follow-up to knight e6. I mean, it looks like we're just going to capture the pawn and uh, ask white to prove the point. Not sure. We'll try again. Another suggestion. Yes. Knight d7. That was the move that uh, Fabi played, and it is a really, really powerful move. And I'm absolutely, I have no doubts that while Magnus probably, it flickered in his mind that knight d7 was such a possibility, he underestimated the power of the move knight to d7. So what white is actually threatening? If it was white to move, White would play the move knight takes d5. So for example, rook takes b3, knight takes, knight takes, and rook to e5. This is what is the threat. That's what it's all about right there. So you really have to do something, and it's not easy uh, to make a suggestion. If you play knight takes f4, 
Then I've got knight takes b6, that's a tempo against the rook, and that's a tempo also against the knight. In the game, Magnus has played rook takes b3, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and I've <laughs> like the magician that spoils the trick, <laughs> I've already showed you what, uh, what the threat was. And the threat of rook e5, this is, uh, this is uh, the problem. Um, black has n no move. Uh, he has to move the knight. And after knight c3, what did, uh, what did uh, Fabi play? This one should be easy, easy peasy. Rook c1, g5, g5, that's a nice move. How many of you like the move G5? It's coming from the chat. Not many takers. That's good. That's good. <laughs> chat. How many of you like Knight F6 check? Very good. Uh, Knight F6 check is a killer move. Uh, the computer thinks that there is a stronger move in the move D5, but essentially knight f6 check and Magnus resigns. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty good move when your opponent resigns, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I don't know, but uh, that, that, that's really nice. And the whole point is Magnus did not want to see uh, moves like king g7, rook check, king, rook, ugh, ugh. King is going to walk the plank, and you're going to get mated uh, after h4, right? Uh, you have to play after knight f6 check king here. And once again, you don't want to go and walk the plank after rook e5. And from this point on, uh, there's a forced mate. So from the position that Magnus resigned in, you have to actually play king f8, and after knight takes king uh, g8, pardon me, and then after knight f6, king f8. And this is just not what uh, the world's number one had in mind. So this is the first game that Fabi has won in eight years in classical chess against Magnus Carlsen. So let's give an applause to Fabiano. That's very, 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 very nice. And that, uh, for me, uh, it's always thrilling when an American plays against a world champion or plays against the number one player in the world. I always, you know, I cheered my colleagues uh, uh, whenever they had that opportunity. And winning, and winning in a very convincing style, I think Fabi can take a bow. At this moment, I'd just like to turn over the conversation, the lecture to yourselves. Uh, was there any questions about the game? Uh, something that happened earlier maybe you would have? Well. Yes. Uh, yes. The, the, uh, so uh, the computer, um uh, marks um, yes. the uh, knight f6 move is dubious. Yes. Um, and what does it like? Uh, yes. What does it about knight c5? Uh, it, it, it thinks that this move is second best, if you will, yeah. and it really likes uh -huh. pushing the pawn. It really likes the idea that you should play d5, d6, knight check, and d7. It thinks the moment you get your knight on f6, you get your pawn to d7, that is uh, Johnny Ballgame. So it really, really likes uh, d5. I really, really like knight f6 check. And 
funnily enough, uh, once more, after move by king f8, I like grabbing the pawn. The engine also really, really likes the move d5. So I take the pawn, man. <laughs> you, like, the engine thinks that black should, should play in this position, king f8. So it's sort of like, great, if you want to play king g8 and king f8 and I get to take a pawn for free, give me the pawn with three and then I'll think about, I'll find the move d5, don't get me wrong. That's, that's a pretty uh, convincing looking move and there's nothing wrong with pushing a pass pawn, especially a centralized pass pawn. Uh, but uh, that, was, uh, that was the answer that sometimes the engine likes a variation, in this case d5, uh, and the human instinct is to get ahead, get ahead. And I think behind you, uh, gentleman in the red, yes, yes. I have the same question. The same question. Wow, I got a two for one. <laughs> That's great. Just a second. Uh, let me give myself a kiss. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, in that case, I want to thank you all very much for coming. It was a real treat for me. Uh, like Ben says, it's been quite some time that I've actually just been able to give a lecture. Uh, normally I'm uh, doing the broadcast, and the broadcasts are coming up. It's, it's, as you see behind me, uh, we've got some tournaments coming to St. Louis, but our very next broadcast, we have rehearsals tomorrow. The Grand Chess Tour, uh, flares anew, and... Um, Wednesday. Yeah, uh, rehearsals tomorrow. Wednesday is round one. Uh, in Croatia, in Zagreb, the uh, Rapid and Blitz will uh, begin and by the way it will feature as a wild card one of the wild cards in the 10 player um, round robins will be Magnus Carlsen. Magnus as you know gave up his if you will call it that his classical world chess championship title and Magnus really enjoys playing rapids and blitz and it seems to me that that's where he's really concentrating himself and he enjoys that and he's going to be a wild card. So that will be coming up Grand Chess Tour. Then following the Grand Chess Tour right behind me, I have my reunion. My, I don't go to my high school reunions. I go to the U.S. Senior Championships. <laughs> the U.S. Senior Championships, I get to see all of the chess legends those players I did battle with for so many <clears throat> uh, decades. <laughs> it sounds pretentious, but yes, so many decades, and that's coming up. But also, uh, Legends in the Future uh, will have the girls' uh, championships. Uh, vote those of you, Alice Lee, a top, top uh, player, will not be the number one player in the field in the girls' competition. Do you know who the number one player in the girls' competition is going to be? Not Alice Lee. Carissa, Carissa Yip. Carissa Yip is, is attending in Stanford. Uh, she declines the U.S. women's invitation. She's the number two player in the United States for the ladies' competition. Carissa is. But because she's going to Stanford and because the U.S. women's championship is played over uh, days that she has to attend school. She declined, but she's coming for the girls' competition. And then, of course, there's the junior competitions. We don't say the boys. We say the juniors because any of the ladies could qualify. And I believe, for example, Carissa would have been uh, el eligible or play in the juniors if she had wanted. So we'll have the seniors, uh, the legends of the past, and we'll We'll get a glimpses of the future. So uh, really good events coming up and it all start with the Grand Chess Tour on Wednesday. With that, I wanna say thank you all very much and it's been my pleasure. <laughs> really, 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 really great. It was really great. And my thanks to chat and of course our, our uh, computer photographer Audio man extraordinaire, Ben Simon, everyone. Ben Simon. 
Uh, don't be booing back there. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye bye. It's 2023, and the Grand Chess Tour is back for its eighth trip around the world. Inspired by former world champion Gary Kasparov, the Grand Chess Tour hosts the top players to compete for top prizes. Eight of the world's best join tournament wild cards and travel to four different countries to fight for a $1.4 million prize fund. The tour kicks off in Bucharest, Romania for the Superbet Chess Classic. Then things speed up as we move to Warsaw, Poland and Zagreb, Croatia for the first two Rapid and Blitz events. The tour then makes its way to St. Louis, Missouri for the final two events. We're back in November for the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz and the illustrious Sinkfield Cup. When points are up for grabs, the best players show up. Who will be crowned the new champion? Find out when the Grand Chess Tour returns.